We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online, and then we have in-person services on our campus at nine and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Morning, everyone. I did hear the TK Burger murmur, so if the Grinch isn't your thing, I'm pretty sure the food will be, so it'll be, it'll be a fun, fun night. That's the Saturday after the dedication on December 5. So as Elliot said, we are three weeks away from our first Sunday in the new kids' building. So again, mark your calendars, Sunday, December 5. Uh, both services are going to be dedication services. So we're going to start here in the auditorium. We'll do the worship like we normally do. Uh, There'll be some teaching that I'll do, and then we're going to head out in front of the kids' building. We're going to gather out there, we're going to say a few prayers of dedication, then we're going to open the kids' building up, and you can walk through and see what it looks like in its uh, finished condition. So it'll be pretty pretty exciting, December 5, to be a part of that. Well, there still are, obviously, a few items to complete on the project. Uh, This week, I think the the new parking lot is going to be striped, Uh, landscaping is going to go in this week. And the city, of course, needs to grant us a certificate of occupancy before we can officially move in. And that certificate certifies that we have met all of the conditions of the conditional use permit that the city of Huntington Beach granted us this past year. And it was that conditional use permit, particularly the amendments to it, that allowed us to submit the plans for this building and to get approval and get the permits required to build this new kids' building. And there are all kinds of conditions. There are safety conditions, of course. There are capacity conditions. There are parking conditions. There are even landscape conditions and many more conditions. But the God who has granted governing authorities like the city of Huntington Beach the the power and the right to set conditions on things like construction, the God who has granted the city that authority has some conditions of his own on the use of this property. So as we prepare to move into our newest building, This is what we're doing in the Sundays leading up to that day. We are considering the conditions under which God will bless the use of these buildings on this campus. We need the city to issue us a certificate of occupancy. But, of course, what we need even more is for God himself and his hand of blessing and his presence to occupy these buildings and everyone who walks in these buildings. And that doesn't just happen because we are a church. God has some very important conditions that he has established for his church. And these conditions, a pretty good summary of these conditions, are found in seven letters that are dictated by Jesus to seven first century churches. And these letters are found in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. So we're looking at the four conditions that are evident in these seven letters. Today we are going to consider the love condition. The love condition. The church of Jesus Christ is to be a gathering of those who love God and love people. Jesus makes this very clear in what he says to the letter, uh, the church that was uh, in Ephesus in modern day Turkey. Here's what we read in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 to this particular church. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered and you have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So let's unpack this letter a little bit this morning. First, kind of a general note of some of the imagery we see at the beginning of this letter. There's, there's an angel. There are stars that are being held in the hand. There is the, the lampstands. Revelation is a a series of poetic paintings that give us the perspective of what the events of heaven look like from the perspective of heaven. And to us, and especially to this world, a church like this 
really is pretty insignificant. But in heaven, that is not the case. In heaven, it turns out, we are the stars of God here on earth. And we are to serve as a lampstand that projects his light into this world. Last week, if you were with us in chapter 1 of Revelation, we saw the image of Jesus walking among these churches, these seven lampstands. And he was, he was clothed in a splendor that was like the sun in all of its brilliance, it said. And then there are these angels that are apparently assigned to each church. Now, for me personally, one of the things I'm looking forward to most in the next life is to see Jesus face to face. That's one of the promises that we are given, and I can't even imagine how amazing that's going to be. But after that amazing, great moment and event, I am really looking forward to meeting the angel that has been assigned to protect this church. I don't know if I get the privilege of doing that, but I think so, and I hope so. But if I do, I can't wait to to talk with this angel. I mean, I, I love to tell the story of Seabreeze because it's a story not of how amazing we are, but of how amazing God's miraculous hand is. I mean, he's over and over again shown up and done some amazing things among us. But I've only seen this story from this side, from the perspective of earth. And I would love to go through some of the moments in our history as a church and hear what was going on in the spiritual realm to hear about maybe some of the great unseen battles that were taking place while we were trying to figure things out here on earth. I don't know, but I'm looking forward to that moment. Now, in each of these seven letters, there is a a thumbs up and a thumbs down. There's something that, that Jesus commends these churches for and something that he challenges them about. The thumbs up for this church was their commitment to the truth. They had stayed faithful to the truth of God, which, as we will see in the letter that we look at next Sunday, was not the case for all of these churches. In Ephesus, which was kind of the sin city of of the ancient Roman world, they did not tolerate those who are wicked, it says. Ephesus, as a city, was very accepting and tolerant of what God had very clearly said was wrong. But in the face of tremendous cultural pressure, pressure, This church had stayed true to what God says is true. Their commitment to the truth had not wavered. In fact, they had encountered several people that had kind of come through the church, and they had claimed to be apostles from God, individuals who were kind of updating God's idea of what is right and what is wrong. They had tested these apostles, and they'd found them to be liars. So when it came to the truth, this church had done a great job. But now, the not-so-great news, the thumbs down. Verse 4, the letter goes on to say this, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Their love had grown cold for God and for people. Now, this is not just a first-century church problem. As churches age, this tends to happen. Their love for Jesus and their love for others tends to fade. This church, Seabreeze, is 33 years old. So as a church, we're still relatively young. But if you talk to those who were here in the early years, and you ask them to tell you some stories of what it was like back then, it'll become pretty clear that there was something special about those early days. There was something special about our love for God and and our love for others. You see, a young church is just struggling to survive. And as such, they don't have much to offer in the way of services. So those who tend to stick around are those who want to be there because they really love God and want to grow. And the other thing that's true in the early years is that every new individual that showed up on a Sunday was amazing. It was a sign of new life. And we had to work really hard at not swarming them and making them feel awkward and uncomfortable. But as the church grows and as more people come around, you know, now if you're a new person, we work really hard at trying to help new people feel comfortable and 
and help them find their way just like many of us found our way in those early days. But the simple fact is it's harder to identify a new person now in the crowd. It's easy for us to miss them. So new churches just almost automatically love well. And that really, when you think about it, that's the nature of new love in general. Whether it's marriage love or love for God or love for people. Over time, the problem is new love tends to fade. It happens in marriages, happens in churches. But that doesn't mean we should just let nature take its course and let our love grow cold. Jesus told this church in Ephesus that if they didn't address this, he was actually going to remove their lampstand. This is how important this condition is. And when Jesus removes a lampstand for a church, the translation is that basically the the plug is pulled on that church, and the power of God in that church goes. The angel assigned to that church leaves. When the angel leaves a church, there is no fanfare. In fact, it's rarely noticed. But when an angel walks away from the church that Jesus has assigned it to, that church begins to die. So what can be done about this love problem? There are two phrases that follow this warning in this letter to the church of Ephesus. These are the two phrases. The first phrase is, consider how far you have fallen. Go back and consider how you got to this point. The second statement is, repent and do the things you did at first. So whether it's a love for God, whether it's a love for people, whether it's the love in your marriage, these are the two action steps that we can take to rekindle love that has faded and grown cold and hard. Two action steps. We're going to look at these this morning. Action step number one is this. Consider the past rightly. The phrase is, consider how far you have fallen. In other words, look back and and accurately analyze and understand what it is that tends to happen over time that causes love to fade. Why does this just almost always happen? How did you get here? So let's consider that. What is the difference between new love and old love? History, time. New love is full of hope. Old love is full of memories. So I've got a graph to kind of show you what I think happens with love over time. This is what new love looks like. So on this side over here, you see the timeline, so it's new. So you're at this line right here. And so whether it's a marriage, whether it's your love for God, whether it's another person, uh, if it's new and you look to the future, it's pretty much all hope. You're newly married. You just became a Christian. You're newly falling in love with God. There's all kinds of hopes about what's going to happen and how everything's going to be amazing and how it's going to get better. Your memory, on the other hand, is a week, a year, a few days, because love is new. You don't have a lot of memory, a lot of history, because of where you are on the timeline. That's the nature of new love. But as time goes on, let's look at old love. As time goes on, what happens? The timeline slides, and now you've got more memory, more history, then you do hope. This is just the way it is. Nothing wrong with it. It's just a function of time. There are lots of memories and little hope. Now, since life rarely turns out the way we hoped it would, a good number of those memories are not happy memories. They are painful memories. They are disappointments. And so what tends to happen is pain and disappointment replace hope. And as that occurs, the strong love that we had at the beginning when the future was full of hopes, that begins to fade. And it's replaced with a bitterness over the memories of how life has failed us and this person has failed us and we think maybe God has failed us. And so our hearts towards people and towards God begins to grow cold. It begins to harden. This is just the nature of love when applied to almost anything. So this church, Ephesus, like 
most early churches, when they got started, they were full of hope. One of the big hopes that they had, like every early church had, was that Jesus was going to return any day now to take them out of the horrible persecution they were in and to usher in the future, the, the, the next life. They were all expecting this to happen. I mean, every morning they'd wake up and, I think this is probably the day. And it wasn't. And so what happened over time is that hope was replaced with disappointment. Weeks and months and years passed in silence. And so the hope began to be tarnished. And as more time went on, they became disappointed that they were still in persecution and things were getting worse and Rome was getting more aggressive against these new Christians. And life seemed to be getting worse. So they became disappointed with God. And then another thing that was true of every first century church is they'd all heard stories of the amazing success of what had happened in Jerusalem when that church had first gotten started. If you read about it in the early chapters of the book of Acts in the New Testament, it's an amazing story. Peter had stood up and explained the truth of what Jesus did and his death and his resurrection, and thousands of people responded and said, yes, that's what we want to do. We want to follow Jesus. And we are told in Acts that the church was growing by thousands and thousands and thousands and so you can imagine when each of these new churches were planted in around the Mediterranean basin, they all heard about the story of Jerusalem, and they probably expected something similar to happen. But instead, all of the evidence points to the fact that these early churches, every one of them was small. They were small gatherings that struggled to survive. In fact, as you read through the New Testament, it becomes pretty clear that almost every one of these churches got embroiled in some kind of fight, some kind of struggle. They were small, and they were all a mess. So it's no mystery that their first love, their new love, had faded along with their hopes. So how can we process the past correctly so that new love doesn't turn into an old love that is hard and cold and it fades. I think one of the best verses that describes how to process the past is Hebrews 12, verse 15. Here's what it says. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. If you've been around Seabreeze, you've heard this verse because I think it's so critical for us. There are two options that are presented in this verse. Two options that we have to process the disappointments and the failures of the past. We can either process them in bitterness or we can process them in grace. And the amazing thing is it's our choice. No matter how bad things have been, you can process it in grace. No matter how good things have been, you can process it in bitterness. I've known people that have had amazing lives and they're still bitter. And I've known people who have had horrendous lives and they're countenance in their hearts are warm with gratitude for the kindness of God. It's our choice. You're going to process the past in bitterness or process it in grace. Bitterness turns the disappointments of the past into a soured outlook. That's why it's called bitterness. I mean, everything is bitter. It's kind of like eating something bitter, and then for a while, everything you taste is bitter, even if it's not. You get a soured outlook on the people who have wronged you and towards the God who, from your perspective, stood back and just let it happen. You get mad at God. Bitterness is never contained to the individual who becomes bitter. As it says in this verse, it, it causes trouble. It's a root. It grows, and it defiles all kinds of people. Bitterness is contagious. It darkens our heart, and we stop loving both God and people. The other option, and there is really no middle ground, the other option is grace. What grace does is grace sees the disappointments of the past in light of God's larger plan and his goodness. So what grace says is, yeah, that was hard. That was disappointing. I don't understand why that happened, but I know God has a plan. 
And I know I'm not the only part of the plan. The plan is bigger than me. And so I'm just going to trust that God is going to do something good eventually. I may not see this until I see him face to face, but I'm going to trust in his plan. That's grace. And an understanding that God is good. God's not going to rip us off. He intends us good. Now, it takes faith to see God's grace, which is why in Hebrews 12, 15, it starts out by saying, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, because that's our tendency. We miss it. You can't miss pain. That's obvious. You can't miss bitterness. That'll just happen. But God's grace in the middle of the disappointment, God's grace in the middle of the pain, that's easy to miss. You have to go looking for that. And from my experience, the best grace detector is gratitude. When you look back and you look for ways that you can thank God for what has happened, I would encourage you to do this. Make a list of what you're grateful for. I did this recently. I decided I'm going to spend about a half hour, and I'm just going to start listing the things I'm grateful for. And by the end of the 30 minutes, I had a grace perspective on my past, even though there's disappointments. Gratitude is a great set of lenses, a pair of glasses you can put on that helps you see God's grace, even in the middle of stuff that's really hard. So first, we have to consider the past and decide, how are we going to process the past? Are the memories going to turn us bitter? Or are the memories going to turn us grateful? Then the second step is this. Restart the patterns of love. This is the statement. Repent and do the things you did at first. Go back and ask yourself, when love was new, what did I do? And start doing that. Restart the patterns of love. What did you do at first when the love was new? For me, in my relationship with God, I still remember the fall when my relationship with God was brand new. And one of the main features for me of the fall was I just spent all kinds of time reading the Bible. I read through, for the first time, I read through the Bible in about three and a half months. Not because someone said, you should really do this. Not because suddenly I understood everything I read. But because I, I couldn't get enough of it. It was fascinating. I, was, I wanted to figure it out. I wanted to read and read and read. I just want to spend time. That's part of what happens when love is new. It's the same kind of activity that was true of my early days and my relationship with my wife. We just couldn't get enough time together. There was always stuff to talk about. We were so curious about each other. But what always tends to happen? Love grows old and the demands of life start eroding on that time. You know, when I was engaged... I had a man who was married, been married, I think, probably about 15 years at this time. And he advised me to be sure and schedule time each week with my new wife. And I looked at him like, I don't even understand what your problem is. <laughs> I mean, I actually felt for him. Because from the way I saw it, clearly he didn't love his wife as much as I loved Rebecca. I mean, just the thought of scheduling love? That's not love. That's work. I mean, love is about passion. You don't schedule that. And I felt bad for him. Of course, now I know exactly what he was talking about. <laughs> because if we don't carve out time on our calendar, it won't happen. It's the same in our relationship with God. You, know, you might say, well... Where's the passion for God? Where's the passion of love? It's found in the schedule. What you're passionate about shows up on your schedule. It's in the activities. Next year, my wife and I will celebrate 37 years together. That's old love. We're, we're just suddenly realizing people perceive us as old for some reason. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, but... Apparently, we are. So, we have to keep fighting the fade like everyone does. We don't get a pass on this. 
And what you have to realize is that whether it's a love for God or love for someone else, time is not a friend of love. It just isn't. The same thing happens to your love for God and the love for his church. Time will not be a friend of that. You will have to fight the fade. How? It's in the activities. Love requires four activities. They're listed at the end of the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, New Testament book written to the church in Corinth. Here's what it says in verse 7. It's talking about love, so it says it, speaking of love, and here's the four, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. These are the things that need to show up as activities if the love that has grown cold is rekindled to do the things we did at first. So let's look at through these briefly. First of all, love always protects. The word used here for protect is a Greek word. New Testament is written in Greek. And it means barrier or wall. Well, that kind of sounds like the opposite of love. What it's basically saying is love just keeps putting up walls. But it's not the walls that you're thinking. I mean, think of the most valuable item that you own. Maybe an heirloom, piece of jewelry, maybe your family photo album, maybe your money. My guess is that if you really value it, there's walls around it. It's not just sitting out in the open for someone to say, oh, look, where did this diamond ring come from? No, it's, it's behind walls. It's protected because it's valuable to you. And one of the most important walls needed to protect love is this thing that I've already talked about, and that is time. Love is renewed. It is rekindled. It is kept alive in the moments when the demands of life are pushed out because love is the priority. The walls are put up, and they're saying there's no distractions getting in. If it's marriage, we're spending time together. If it's time with God, we're spending time together. The distractions, the demands of life are walled out so that love can be protected and developed. This is true in marriage. It's true in friendship. It's true in our love for God. If love does not show up on our weekly calendar, it will fade. That's just a fact. So put up some time walls where the important relationships in your life are a priority, where God is a priority. You know, I still love studying the Bible, but nothing like that fall. That was unique. And I learned pretty early on that if I was going to continue to relate to God and listen to his words, I was going to have to set up some walls and say, this is when I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wait until I feel like doing it. I'm just going to do it. Love always protects. Secondly, love always trusts. I mean, we know this. Trust is the foundation on which relationships stand. But trust is, well, it's like a precious commodity, kind of like gold, in that it's, it's really hard to earn. It's expensive, but it can be stolen and taken in an instant. So in a world in which we have all failed and we have been failed, how can we build and rebuild trust? There's two sides to the trust coin. First, be trustworthy. Keep working on being the kind of person that others can count on. Do what you say you're going to do. Show up when you say you're going to show up. And if you fail, which we all do, then the beautiful thing is ask forgiveness. Just be honest. Don't cover it up. Don't blame someone else or them. Just be honest and say, you know what? I blew it. Would you forgive me? And don't expect them, as they forgive you, to say, oh, well, we immediately trust. Wait, allow trust then to put in the time to rebuild trust. So be trustworthy. The other side of the coin is extend trust. You know, if you demand absolute proof that a person is trustworthy, you will never trust anyone. Because we're all flaky to some degree. So we need to take a risk. If you're going to trust, you just need to take some risks. You know the safest approach to people? 
is to avoid them. That's the safest approach. And it's the same, honestly, with God. And I think that's why many people have avoided God. It's just safer that way. You see, if you're isolated and you're completely independent and it's all up to you, that's a lot of work, but no one can fail you then. Of course, you discover that you fail yourself. But love keeps extending trust. Love keeps taking the risk. Now, it doesn't foolishly jump into the arms of someone who has just betrayed them or blindly place their faith in a God that they've never actually logically considered. No, it's thoughtful, but it extends trust. Over time, love keeps putting its heart out there. And it takes steps of faith both in God and in people. Otherwise, what happens is as time goes on, your life gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And you become one of those old people that none of us want to be. Number three, love always hopes. So let's go back to our love timeline, old love, new love. Because we're talking about hope. Always hoping makes sense for young love. But how can old love keep hoping? As time marches on and dreams are turned into memories, and many of those memories are dreams that have been dashed. The answer is that death is not the end. It, it really, the question of, of hope is, where is the finish line for you? What do you think the finish line of life is? Is it death? If that's the finish line, then the, the older you get, the less hope you're going to have because it's just a function of time. You know, I'm 62. I've got a lot less hope in this life than I did when I was 22. Because I've lived for 40 years since then. It's obvious. But the simple fact is, is that this life turns out to be the shortest span of our life. Eternity stretches out beyond this life. See, this, the dotted line is, is our, our death. But that's not the end of us. Eternity stretches on. And it's in eternity, in the next life, that the Bible says there is this kind of hope that's called the blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? The blessed hope is the, the moment and moments where we see the goodness of God in this life. And we see the plan of God from the perspective of heaven. And we see why things went badly and what God was doing. And we see his goodness. It's a blessed hope because it's not a failed hope. It's not a false hope. God will make it right and we will see the good. But if this life is all we have hope in, then as Paul says, we of all people have much to be pitied about. He said this in 1 Corinthians. If this life is all there is, then sooner or later there's no reason to hope, and without hope, love dies. And then lastly, love always perseveres. Love doesn't do these three that we've just talked about once or for a few years, or until it gets hard or until we're really tired. Love keeps doing these, keeps protecting, keeps trusting, keeps hoping. That's why the verse that goes after this one, verse 8, of the last verse in 1 Corinthians 13, simply says, love never fails. The Greek word used here for fail means literally, love never stops flying. It never stops flapping its wings. It's describing a descent and a crash that occurs because people have started coasting. See, we tend to think and we talk in our culture about love like it's some magical condition, like this magic mist that descends on people and, oh, they're in love. And then it, as mysteriously as it arrived, it, it leaves. Oh, they're not in love. Those are statements of condition. That's not God's understanding of love, and he is, of course, the author of love, so I would take his definition. God says love is a commitment to action. Love never stops flapping its wings. 
may need to do some things wisely in some relationships based on how dangerous some people might be. But it doesn't just give up. Love keeps doing the things that are necessary to keep it from crashing. And that's because love only has a chance if we push against the gravity of our own selfishness. Love always is operating against just our selfishness. And so, of course, there are times when the updraft of love is strong and you can just glide on the thermals of love. That's what we call being in love. But then the weather patterns change, the thermals go away, and we discover that love stays aloft because of these three. Always protecting, always trusting, always hoping. So as our kids' ministry gets ready to move into the new building in a few weeks, in part it's going to be because the city of Huntington Beach in the next three weeks grants us a certificate of occupancy. That's looking likely. But as the years go by, the numbers of children and adults that are transformed by what happens in that building and in all of these buildings will be only because God himself is occupying the lives of those who cross the threshold of these buildings. And like the city, God has its own occupancy requirements. A love for him and a love for others. So let me read again what he said to the church in Ephesus and therefore to every church like ours. Revelation 2. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. May that not be true of us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the letter you sent to the church in Ephesus. And we don't shake our heads at them wondering what's wrong with those people because we know by experience that this is true of us. We know that our love for you, if we just coast, it will, it will fade, it will grow cold, our hearts will harden, and bitterness will take over grace. And we will stop protecting the time that's required for love to grow. We'll stop trusting. We'll stop having a reason to hope in the future because we're looking for things to work out just in this life the way we want it. So, Father, I pray that this particular church in our 33rd year as we get ready to move into our final building, oh, God, I pray you would rekindle in us a love for you and a love for the people that you place around us. Help us to repent and do the things that we did at first. Help us to consider the past in the light of your grace and not in the poison of our bitterness. We pray this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.